I am Dr. Anjum Rashid. Today I will discuss cerebral palsy in children. I will discuss its causes, risk factors, symptoms, types, associated disorders and the prognosis of walking. Cerebral palsy is a non-progressive, static, chronic impairment of muscle tone, strength, coordination and posture that originated from some sort of cerebral insult before birth or around the time of delivery or during the first two years of life. It is often accompanied by developmental disabilities, mental retardation, vision, hearing and speech impairment, cognitive and behavior abnormalities, and epilepsy. Cerebral palsy is an umbrella term. It encompasses many different motor disorders and is not just one disorder. It has many different causes and is of variable severity. There are a wide variety of associated deficit and it is a permanent condition and not inherited. Cerebral palsy is the most common motor disability of the childhood. In developing countries, incidence is about 1.5 to 5.6 per thousand live births, and in developed countries, it is 2 to 2.5 per thousand live births. It occurs in all races. It is more common in poor socioeconomic status and male gender. Now, what causes cerebral palsy? In this insult to the child brain can occur prenatally, perinatally, or postnatally, or during infancy. 80% of the cases are due to prenatal factor, and less than 10% are due to intrapartum asphyxia. Now, maternal, prenatal, and gestational risk factors for the cerebral palsy include previous pregnancy loss, previous loss of newborn, maternal mental retardation, maternal thyroid disorder, especially iodine deficiency, maternal seizure disorder, history of delivering a child with weight less than 2 kg, history of delivering a child with a motor deficit, sensory deficit, or mental retardation. Other prenatal and gestational risk factors for cerebral palsy include maternal severe protein urea or high blood pressure, congenital malformation in the fetus, maternal infection such as torch, bleeding in the third trimester, multiple gestation, polyhydramnias, treatment of the mother with thyroid hormone, estrogen or progesterone, maternal methyl mercury exposure or massive irradiation. Now, perinatal risk factor for cerebral palsy include prematurity, low birth weight, intrauterine growth retardation, chorioamnionitis, non-vertex or face presentation of the fetus, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy or birth asphyxia, obstructed complications, cord around the neck, and birth trauma. Postnatal or during infancy, risk factor for cerebral palsy include infections such as meningitis, encephalitis, and sepsis. Intracranial hemorrhage due to prematurity, vascular malformation or trauma, periventricular leukomalacia in premature infants, and carnictrex. Now, other postnatal or during infancy risk factors for the cerebral palsy include hypoxia ischemia, for example, from meconium aspiration syndrome, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn, neonatal hypoglycemia, traumatic brain injury, shaken baby syndrome, or drowning. Now, I will give the functional classification of cerebral palsy. In level 1, the child is ambulatory in all settings and he can walk without limitation. Indoor and outdoor activity is present. In level 2, the child can walk without aids but he has limitation in the community settings. In level 3, the child can walk with aids by handheld mobility devices such as crutches, anterior and posterior walkers that doesn't support the trunk. In level 4, there is self-mobility but with limitation. The child requires wheelchair or adult help. He may use power devices. In level 5, the child is dependent for mobility. There is no self-mobility and he cannot sit and stand even with adoptive equipment. Now I will discuss the clinical features of cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a clinical diagnosis. It is difficult to diagnose before 6 months of age because the full-blown picture is not evident till 2 years of age when the brain growth ceases. Now, earliest diagnosis of cerebral palsy can be made at 3 months due to persistence of primitive reflexes. So, suspect cerebral palsy if the dull eye reflex is present more than 3 weeks, stepping more than 6 weeks, moro more than 3 months, atonic neck reflex more than 6 months, or the lendo reflex is absent. Now, the classification of cerebral palsy. First is the spastic cerebral palsy, which includes hemiplegic, diplegic, or quadriplegic cerebral palsy. Second is the extrapyramidal or dyskinetic, also known as ethytoid or choreoethytoid cerebral palsy. Third is the atonic cerebral palsy and the ataxic cerebral palsy. And fourth is the mixed cerebral palsy. Spastic cerebral palsy occur in 80% of the cases. In this, there is spasticity, which is the velocity-dependent hypertonia. Now, there is hypotonia with hyperreflexia for the first 6 to 12 months of life and this is followed by spasticity. 
Spastic hemiplegia may be due to focal cerebral infarction, cerebrovascular accident due to thromboembolic phenomena, vascular malformation or inherited clotting disorders. It may be due to structural brain abnormalities such as hemibrain atrophy or post-hemorrhagic porencephaly. Asymmetric periventricular leukomalacia in premature infant can also cause spastic hemiplegia. In spastic hemiplegia, one side of the body is involved. Arm is affected more than the leg. There is decreased spontaneous movement and relative weakness of one side. Hand preference is present at a very early age. Walking is delayed until 18 to 24 months of life. And on the affected side, circumductive gait is present. Tiptoe walking is due to ankle equinovirus. In spastic hemiplegia, affected upper extremity assume a flexed posture. Shoulder is adducted, elbow is flexed, forearm is pronated, wrist is flexed, hand clenched in a fist and thumb is present in the palm. In spastic hemiplegia, upper motor neuron lesion signs are positive, that is spasticity, brisk tendon reflexes, ankle clonus, and upgoing Babinski sign. There is also growth arrest of the affected limb. One third of the cases have seizure disorders and 25% have mental retardation. Spastic diplegia accounts for 35% cases of cerebral palsy. In premature infant, it is due to parenchymal, intraventricular hemorrhage or periventricular leukomalacia, while in term infant, the causes may be multifactorial, including ischemia, infection, endocrine or metabolic causes. In spastic diplegia, both legs are involved more than the arms. There is delay in gross motor skill. First clinical indication is noted when the infant begins to crawl. The child uses arm in normal reciprocal fashion but tend to drag the legs behind as a rudder, rather than using the normal four-limb crawling movements. In spastic diplegia, there is often a period of hypotonia followed by extensive spasticity in lower limbs by 6 to 18 months of age. Scissoring posture of the lower limbs is due to excessive adduction of hips. There is difficult diaper application, walking is delayed and tiptoe walking is present. Lower limbs have disused atrophy and contractures of ankle and feet. In spastic diplegia, lower limbs have brisk tendon reflexes, upgoing Babinski sign and positive ankle clonus. There are language problems, vision abnormalities and learning difficulties. However, intellectual development is normal and seizures are usually absent. Spastic quadriplegia account for 20% cases of cerebral palsy. The risk factors include low birth weight, perinatal asphyxia, infection, structural brain abnormalities, endocrine or metabolic genetic or developmental disorders. It is the most severe form of cerebral palsy. Four extremities are equally affected. There is spasticity in all limbs with decreased spontaneous movement. There is also disuse atrophy and flexion contracture of knees and elbow. In spastic quadriplegia, there are brisk tendon reflexes in all four limbs. Ankle clonus is present and there is upcoing Benzki sign. Hips are usually flexed and adducted and knees are flexed and in valgus deformity. However, they may be extended or varus deformity may be present. In foot, there is equinus deformity with valgus or varus of the hind foot. In spastic quadriplegia, supranuclear bulbal palsies can lead to swallowing difficulties and aspiration pneumonia. Vision, hearing and speech abnormalities are present. Seizures are also common. There is severe mental retardation and microcephaly is present in 25% of the cases. Now, extrapyramidal or dyskinetic cerebral palsy account for 20% of the cases. It is characterized more by abnormal involuntary movements. Its causes include connectress, hypoxic ischemic injury to the basal ganglia, mitochondrial disorders or metabolic disorders such as glutaric aciduria. In it, arms are involved more than the legs. There is early hypotonia with poor head control and marked head lag. The child develops increased variable tone with rigidity and dystonia over several years. In extrapyramidal cerebral palsy, there are involuntary slow twisting movement that primarily involve proximal muscle of extremities, trunk and neck. This abnormal movement pattern becomes obvious after two years of age. And this movement increases with stress, excitement and purposeful activity. In extrapyramidal cerebral palsy, feeding may be difficult, tongue thrust or drooling is prominent, speech may be absent or slurred, there is sensory neural deafness, however upper motor neuron signs are absent, seizures are uncommon and intellect is usually preserved. Atonic cerebral palsy is rare, there is marked hypotonia, there is difficulty in holding trunk and head against the gravity, reflexes are brisk and there is severe cognitive delay. Ataxic cerebral palsy is also rare. There is jerky, unsteady, poorly coordinated movements, intention tremors, 
A simple test for ataxia is that hold a finger or a toy in front of the child and ask him to touch it in the first try. The child with ataxia cannot do it. In ataxic cerebral palsy, there is also hydrocephalus and it is usually caused by some genetic factors. Now, in a mixed form of cerebral palsy, there are mixed features of all above types. It is due to combination of insult to multiple cerebral areas. In this, there are multiple complications, seizures, sensory deficit, cognitive and perceptual impairments, all are very common. Now friends, I will discuss the associated disorders of the cerebral palsy. These include recurrent chest infection, serous otitis media, urinary tract infection, constipation, oromotor dysfunction, gastroesophageal reflux disease, feeding difficulties due to bulbar dysfunction. There is also malnutrition, dental caries, diaper rash, bed sores, vision impairment, hearing problems, and speech abnormalities. Other associated disorders of cerebral palsy include microcephaly or macrocephaly due to hydrocephalus. There may be functional disabilities, epilepsy, cognitive impairment, and behavior abnormalities. Now, musculoskeletal problems in cerebral palsy include decreased mineral density of the bones, limb length discrepancies, joint deformities, kyphoscoliosis. In hips, there may be dislocation or flexion contractures. In knees, there may be flexion contractures and knock knees. Windswept posture may be present, which is the flexion contracture of hip and knees with rotation of the femur at hip socket and the pelvic bone unleveling. Foot and ankle deformities and foot bunions may be present in a CP child. In cerebral palsy, shoulder is usually adducted in the affected limb. Elbow has flexion contracture and pronation deformities. In the wrist, there is flexion contracture with deviation towards the ulna or radial bone. In hands, there is finger deformities with thumb in the palm. Now, the usual walking pattern in cerebral palsy includes seizured gait pattern. Second common walking pattern in cerebral palsy is crouched posture. Another common walking pattern in cerebral palsy is tiptoe walking. Circumductive gait is present in hemiplegic cerebral palsy. Walking with stiff necks may be a gait pattern in cerebral palsy. Another gait pattern in cerebral palsy is in-toeing or out-toeing walking pattern. Now I will discuss the prognosis of walking in cerebral palsy. In hemiplegic cerebral palsy it is 100%, in diaplegic it is 90%, in ataxic it is 88%, in quadriplegic cerebral palsy it is 18% and in dyskinetic cerebral palsy it is usually 0%. Now if a CP child sit unsupported before 2 years of age, there is 97% chance that he will walk. If he sit unsupported between 2 to 4 years of age then there is only 50% chance of walking. However, if a child sit unsupported after 4 years of age, then there is only 3% chance that he will walk. Now, if atonic neck reflex is present at 4 years of age, then there is 0% chance of walking. Thanks for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to my channel.